is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. European equities edge higher ahead of a key few days for central banks with decision expected from the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, and the PBOC. UBS completes a takeover of former rival Credit Suisse, sealing the biggest merger in banking since the 2008 financial crisis. It also creates a wealth management titan. Plus, a new electoral headache for UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak after former leader Boris Johnson and two of his allies quit Parliament, triggering at least three by-elections. We'll discuss a political fallout and also explore Britain's deteriorating investing climate. Now, good morning, everyone. Let's check on the markets. Because it's a big week for markets overall, there's, of course, a lot of concern or a lot of questions about what central banks will and won't do. The BOJ on Friday probably seems the most straightforward. This is because bond markets, for the moment, are on side with the new governor for BOJ. The other question is what happens to the Fed. You tell the markets one thing and they interpret it as something else. We had 10 consecutive hikes. Um, what does that mean going forward? Are they going to wait? Which is why they expected to see the impact of interest rate hikes for, of course, the economy. European stocks for the moment gaining six tenths of eight percent. The U.S. ten-year yield three seven six two seven. Now joining us to talk about all of these markets, Ian Steely. He's J.P. Morgan Asset Management's international chief investment officer for fixed income. Ian, what a day to have you. I mean, what a week. It's going to be crazy. Are you like ready for it? I think so. I think yeah. So, yeah no, obviously, uh, lot, lots going on. Inflation a prints, lot's going central on. banks. There's a lot. I mean, a new ECB print in, in terms of forecast going forward. W what does it mean for fixed income? Is now the time to load up on treasuries? We've had a nice repricing over the, over the last few weeks as the market has priced out some of those cuts that were that were booked in for the second half of this year. So, from a valuation standpoint, definitely looking a bit better than we were, say, a couple of months ago. I think the, the big question, of course, though, is going to be around the Fed. And if the pause, how hawkish is that, that pause? And then, of course, we've got some inflation data, which is going to be important as well, to, even, even before that Fed meeting. So I think a lot of it is dependent on the inflation print, a lot of it is dependent on what the Fed, Fed has to say and, and Jerome Powell has to say, particularly in the press conference. And I think uh, you know, markets will probably take some direction from that. Yeah, how hawkish do you think that, that pause will be? And, and again, the market, right, always understands something else. They keep on telling them that for the moment they're very, that, that they want to raise rates. Um, or if not raise rates, certainly they're very vigilant on inflation. But the market keeps on interpreting it as something else. I think the market at the moment has got its head around the fact that they are going to pause. I think Jerome Powell's been very clear about that. And then we've obviously got a hike priced in, in for the July meeting. I think what will be interesting, again, from a you know, dot plot standpoint, where do we think... We're going to, whether the, or whether the Fed think they're going to end the year, is it going to be that maybe an additional one? More than that will be obviously seen as, as hawkish and, and negative for bond markets. But I think really, I think the bigger picture as we take a step back, yeah, we've done a huge amount of hiking over the last 15 months or so, and we are starting to see you know, cracks occurring, albeit maybe a little bit slower than, than people had felt. Um, and it does feel like we're towards... The end game. You know, we're not. We're definitely closer to the end than we are the beginning, which ultimately means, from a long-term perspective, fixed income is is looking attractive. But you know, then we heard actually from Larry Summers saying, "Look, the economy is hot, hot, hot in the U.S." He did say it was hot, 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 but he also said it's not as hot as it was six or twelve <laughs> months ago. So that I mean, that's what we're seeing come through. We are seeing the data slowing. Obviously, I'm not going to just use one initial jobless claims no. print, but that's the that's the the jobs market is is important. We obviously had pretty weak print on Thursday, and it doesn't look no. like some of the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the uncertainty around that number as it, as it was a couple of months ago with Massachusetts. It looks like that is a, a reasonable print. So I do, start, I do think we're starting to see slowing. It's just, are we slowing fast enough for the Fed when they are very concerned that they pause too early and inflation becomes embedded and it, and it doesn't get back down to target? It, it did. Uh, the Bank of Canada and the RBA last week actually pause and make you think. Did it change? If it didn't change what you're expecting from the Fed, did, did it, you know, question what you're, you're expecting them to do? I, I don't think it, it really had an impact on, on this meeting. I think when you look at Canada, Australia, you know, Norway's being thrown out there as well at the moment, they all stopped a lot earlier than the Fed did. The Fed's done a lot, a lot more, particularly in the case of, of Australia and, and Norway. So I feel that... Yes, you probably do need to you know, take some consideration into the fact that they paused and then, and then had to go again. But I think the Fed has, a, you know, has, has done a, a bigger schlog you know, from the beginning than they, than they had. 
Um, yeah, I mean, we also have the Bank of Japan. Is that maybe the easiest, actually, out of all the meetings, given bond markets for the moment are, su are supporting the governor? Probably, but it probably shouldn't be either, because when you look at the inflation prints in, J in Japan, depending on which measure you take, we're somewhere between 3 and 4 percent. You know, negative interest rates, yield curve control, it doesn't really make sense. Are they going to do something? It, it, we've definitely been led down the path that they're not, although I would argue that we were led down that path in, in December and the way for the Bank of Japan to change policy is to, to really rip the Band-Aid off yeah. uh, and do it when the market's not expecting. So let's yeah. not completely completely rule anything out on Friday. And, they, and I think they definitely should, should be doing something or at least be thinking about doing something. I mean, it's interesting. It's an outlier call, right? You, not many think like you. Well, I think a lot of people think that the policy isn't really in keeping with with where the, the economy is going, but yeah. we've obviously had such clear direction yeah. from the Bank of Japan that they're going to keep with it. It's very difficult to fight that. Although, as I say, you know, yeah. the, the time to, to make those changes is when no one's expecting it. Um, and what about ECB? I think the ECB is probably the easiest, easiest decision yeah. because they're ultimately, they still have an inflation problem. We have thankfully seen core inflation come down over the last couple of months, but it's still far too high for them. They've, they've, they've given very clear guidance. They expect to raise rates by 25 basis points, probably over the next couple of meetings. The market's fully on board with that. Yeah. That's fully priced in. I think the problem the ECB's got is more further out, right. because obviously we've had a couple of negative quarters of growth in a row. We've, when we look at some of the, particularly the manufacturing PMI yeah. data, it's looking a bit challenging for Europe at the moment. And again, they don't want to make the mistake of so forcing, forcing that recession yeah. Um, to keep inflation under control when inflation might be coming down off its own back with, uh, with slowing growth. But you know, core inflation is, is too high at the moment for them. But, but at the same time, I mean, I think they, they may have other problems, right? It could be TLTROs, it could be the Italian banks because of yeah. widening of spreads. Is there anything now that they can do to try and temper that? I think they've, they've, they've been very clear that they're going to support peripheral government bonds. They're going to use the policies that they've already put in place if yeah. required. I think what's actually been fairly maybe surprising to a lot of people is how well peripheral spreads have, have held in over the last well, few months and, and the hiking cycle and actually you know, the European market seems reasonably steady at, at the moment. I think it's really going to be just a case of you know, continue to do the hikes. What's the, uh, what's the longer term impact of that? Um, so how do you, I mean I was going to ask you about PBOC and actually whether we, we will see something significant and how you play that on the market. It's, it's difficult to see something really significant from from the PBOC. Obviously, I think you know, they've continued over the last few years to put uh, support in place as required, and it does look mm -hmm. like we're, we're going down that route. Are you going to see major rate cuts? That isn't normally the policy that they, that they put in place, but I wouldn't be surprised if you see some specific, some specific help from, yeah. from them. Um, I, but I think really, it's, I say, it's more the, the major central banks that is, the market is focusing on at the moment. Okay, Ian, thanks so much. You're going to have a busy week. A lot of coffee. I hope a lot of espressos to keep you going. Ian Steely, JP Morgan, Asset Management's International Chief Investment Officer for Fixed Income. Now, London Tech Week starts today. We'll be there live for a couple of days. Our Tom McKenzie's on the ground. Well, he'll also be speaking to um, Demis Asabis, the founder of DeepMind. He understands more than anyone, of course, what happens with AI. Let's head over to London Tech Week now, where the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is also speaking. Position as one of the world's tech capitals, but to go even further and make this the best country in the world to start, grow, and invest in tech businesses. That is my goal, and I feel a sense of urgency and responsibility to make sure that we seize it, because one of my five priorities is to grow our economy, and the more we innovate, the more we grow. But this isn't just about economics. Like you, I believe that innovation is one of the most powerful forces for transforming people's lives. And right now, there is an opportunity for human progress that could surpass the Industrial Revolution in both speed and breadth. I believe the UK can achieve this goal because we start from a position of strength. We've created 134 unicorns in the last decade, third in the world behind only the US and China. We're one of the most digitally literate societies in the world, with a higher percentage of STEM graduates than the US and four of the world's top 10 universities. We've got extraordinary strengths in fintech, cyber and creative industries and engineering biology, where from the Crick and the Biobank to DeepMind's AlphaFold, 
We're pushing at the boundaries of what is possible in health. And the UK is the best place in Europe to raise capital, with more invested in tech here than in France and Germany combined. But today, I want to answer a simple question. What's the single most important reason innovators like you should choose this country? The answer is leadership. Do you trust the people in charge to really get what you're trying to do? With this government and with me as your Prime Minister, you can. Judge us not by our words, but our actions. It's this government that's building the most pro-investment tax regime, that's increasing public R&D investment to record levels, that's making our visa system for international talent one of the most competitive in the world. We're overhauling our listing rules to make it easier for companies to raise public funding and changing our pension rules to unlock new private capital. And we're changing the way government itself works. I created a brand new department focused on science, innovation and technology with a mission to do things differently from bringing in world leading experts to taking more risks in support of innovation. And when the moment came, it was this government that acted to rescue Silicon Valley Bank. So today I'm proud to announce the launch of HSBC Innovation Banking, the most significant global tech bank, combined with HSBC's firepower and headquartered here in the UK. And of course, it's the UK where Google chose to bring together its entire AI division. Under the leadership of a Brit, Demis Asabis, at Google DeepMind. And if our goal is to make this country the best place in the world for tech, AI is surely one of the greatest opportunities before us. As Chancellor, I doubled the number of AI scholarships because even back then I recognized the potential of AI as a general purpose technology. Now with most things in life, the more you learn about them, We'll keep a very close eye, of course, on anything that happens in London Tech Week. Rishi Sunak also about to have a conversation with the DeepMind founder, Demis Asabis. And then, of course, probably in that conversation, he'll also address some of the defeats, bruising defeats, that the Tories had last weekend or on Friday because of Boris Johnson. Coming up, we'll look ahead to the central bank decisions this week, including the Fed and the ECB. This is Bloomberg. So it will be a pivotal 36 hour for markets later this week as monetary policy is determined for over 60% of the world's GDP. The Fed, the ECB, the Bank of Japan and PBOC are all set to deliver rate decisions. Now for more on all of this, we're joined by Bloomberg Markets reporter Valerie Teitel here in London and Bloomberg's Europe correspondent Maria Tadeo in Brussels. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, Valerie, if we start with the Fed, what are we expecting? And actually, is this the time where we pause because we need to figure out what the 10 hikes mean? <laughs> yeah, the 10 hikes and the 500 basis points the Fed has done in, in less than 14 months. But the, uh, the base case for the markets and for economists is that they do pause in their rate hiking cycle here. Um, but the key for the markets is going to be what kind of short-term guidance is Powell going to give and what is going to be reflected in that dot plot. It's interesting to note we've seen in the last month the first real hints of a division at the Fed. Uh, there's been a lot of chat and what kind of things does Powell have to do to appease the hawks in order to prevent a dissent. Remember, Powell has done a phenomenal job in this rate hiking cycle in preventing dissents uh, and having everyone on his side. But we might start to see uh, cracks in that kind of consensus uh, start to form uh, from here. Uh, it, it could possibly sound, uh, get him to sound more hawkish in the yeah. press conference or uh, perhaps give it more of a direct steer to hikes in July. Valerie, thank you so much. We'll get on to also what we're expecting from the ECB. But now let's head back to London Tech Week, where the UK Prime Minister is hosting a fireside chat with the DeepMind chief executive. Science Here they are. and medicine, the energy transfer to transition and improve the lives of billions of people. So Prime Minister, I was wondering, what do you think are the biggest opportunities for AI to make a positive impact in the UK? Well, first of all, thanks, Demis, for having me and congratulations on everything you're doing. 
I, you know, I think I, if I think about it, there's, there's the obvious economic one. Yeah, I talked about AI being a general purpose technology. And this idea of every job essentially having AI as a co-pilot, just making everyone's job a little bit easier, a little bit more productive, and that replicated across an entire economy obviously has enormous potential mm -hmm. to change how we do things. Uh, so I think that's probably the first one. Uh, beyond that, in public services, health and education, I think in health we're already seeing uh, the promise of what AI can do, whether it's new drug discovery or helping doctors do surgery more accurately and faster or indeed detect cancers and other things much earlier than they otherwise would. And we're just at the beginning of the innovation that's happening. There's something you know well with AlphaFold on the drug discovery side. So that, to me, seems potentially transformative. And education is, is the thing that I'm most excited about because it's the thing I'm most passionate about. You know, I always say that there's not many things that are silver bullets in public policy, but world-class education is probably the closest we have to it. It's the best way to spread opportunity, to reduce inequality. And the power of AI to... You know, reduce teachers' workloads and burdens, lesson planning, marking, but also to provide personalised learning for each individual, which we know when it comes to tutoring is so powerful. Now, technology, you know, holds out the promise that every pupil, every student having a personalised tutor, um, I think that potentially is just extraordinary in terms of the good it can do. So those are probably the things that I'm most excited about. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, I agree with all of those things. And I think this is the potential, actually, specifically in the UK and, and also London, of fusing together AI with all of the great strengths we have in many other sectors, like fintech and biology, like you yeah. said, gaming, all of these other sectors where AI, I think, can have some you know, massive transformations. So how do you think um, the UK, you know, we can make the UK the best place in the world to both start and scale up tech companies? You know, I, you know, I hear this a lot. I think the first thing to say is we're already a great place to scale up a tech business. And I, I mentioned the stat in my remarks. If you look at the last decade, more unicorns in this country than anywhere other than the US and China. So I, I think that's a pretty good record and a good base for us to start from. Uh, but obviously, we need to keep doing more. We need to keep pushing ourselves. You know, the first thing is people. I think there's an extraordinary stat. Something like half of all of our fastest growing innovation businesses have a foreign born founder. So that tells you you need a visa system that attracts the best and the brightest to the UK. And I think we've got one. Um, whether it's the new scale up visa that I introduced as Chancellor for companies who are scaling up to be able to get the talent they need, whether it's our innovator founder visa, which is globally extremely competitive, or the high potential individual visa that I created, which essentially says if you graduated from a global top 50 university, just come to the UK. You don't need a job offer. We just want to make sure that um, you can speak English and that you have a certain amount of money to support yourself. But otherwise, we just want you here because we think it will be additive to our economy. That's a massive we're open for business sign um, to the world's most talented. And I think that's important. Capital, look, we're closing the gap. If you look at VC funding as a percentage of GDP, whereas to, you know, we had quite a big gap towards it to the US five, seven years ago, that gap is steadily closing. The Chancellor's making a ton of reforms, pensions, insurance industry, to unlock even more capital. The thing I'd love to get your thoughts on, though, actually, is culture. Mm. Because that, you know, I took that from my time living in California. You obviously know that well as well. Yeah. And the government can do all these things, but fundamentally it requires the entrepreneurs yeah. to just keep going, to be not content with building mm. the £100 million business mm. and then the billion pound business, but just to keep growing. And, and that I found in California is very much the attitude. Yeah. It's just the sky is the limit. Everyone thinks they can create a you know, $100 billion <laughs> company. And actually, you know, changing that culture is, is tough for government to do, but I, I don't know what you think about that. Yeah. That's a, that's a harder bit I, to I totally agree. I mean, I've seen the whole... Um, well, later this morning, you can also watch Tom McKenzie's exclusive interview with the Deep Mind Chief Executive Officer, uh, Demis, one of the most brilliant minds actually out there when it comes to AI and also real understanding of where we end up on AI. Uh, he, of course, leads now Google's AI efforts. And tomorrow, we'll be also be speaking to the UK opposition leader, Keir Starmer, from London Tech Week. Don't miss that conversation at 9.30 a.m. tomorrow morning. Coming up, the takeover is complete. The new UBS becomes a reality. We'll dive into the next phase of Swiss banking next. And this is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, UBS shares edge higher after Lender completed its takeover of Credit Suisse, sealing the biggest merger in banking since the 2008 financial crisis. This was widely expected, UBS gaining 1%. Coming up, only 15% of board members say they understand the risks and benefits of using AI technology. We'll be talking to the CEO of Diligent. European equities rise ahead of a key few days for central banks with decision expected from the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of Japan and the PBOC. UBS completes the takeover of former rival Credit Suisse, sealing the biggest merger in banking since the 2008 financial crisis and creating a wealth management giant. Plus a new electoral headache for the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak after former leader Boris Johnson and two of his allies quit Parliament, triggering at least three by-elections. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, AI and emerging technology risk were the most discussed terms for by directors over the past three months. That's according to a survey by governance risk and compliance company Diligent. Let's find out more with Diligent's Chief Executive Officer, Brian Stafford. Brian, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, first of all, AI is all encompassing. It kind of is it's everywhere and it could change the way we work and live. Is it wrong to think about it as we need an AI specialist on the board or does every manager need to become an AI specialist? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, AI, as you noted, has been the hottest boardroom topic. Uh, and every board is discussing how you apply it, what's the risk of it, how are the opportunities. Uh, most boards that we talk to are not uh, specifically focused on adding an AI expert to their board, just making sure they can up-level the skills for all the directors and management around AI. I mean, AI is everything and anything. What are the top three concerns that you would have on, on how we regulate? Is it cyber attacks or is it actually job displacement? I, I think when you look at uh, when you look at the top three issues associated with AI uh, for companies, uh, everybody's focused on the impact it'll have on jobs. Everybody's focused on whether you'll retain jobs, how you'll increase the productivity of those roles, et cetera. And you're seeing a good number of companies freeze hiring because they expect that incremental productivity. Yeah. There's also risks that come with it. There's the ethical risk around how will you deploy it and use it within your environment. And lastly, it's a risk of, of other things from increased phishing attacks, cybersecurity risks, et cetera. It's going to change the game and the way threat actors interact with companies. I mean, is there a danger that th because it's change everything, you have boards and companies that go into inertia because they don't know where to start? I think when you look across different organizations, and I was just at a large event with, um, with, a, with a very large number of Fortune 100 CEOs, and everybody first and foremost um, believes that there's an opportunity to deploy AI in their organizations to increase productivity. Yeah. Yeah. Where you go beyond increasing productivity and yeah. the impact it has on new product, innovation, et cetera, I think there is a bit of wait and see. You'll see some tech companies move really, really quickly, but other companies wait and see what impact it will have and look at it with different ways to experiment and deploy it in small ways. But Brett, do you think, I mean, automatically it actually helps with productivity? That's what we were saying about, you know, the internet, the World Wide Web, and if you look at a lot of models right now, it's unclear whether it has helped with productivity. I think if you look at the new uh, uh, language models and generative AI, I think most organizations believe it will have a material impact on productivity. And it'll have a material impact on productivity over the next 12 plus months, whether it's in your marketing department, whether it's in sales, um, whether it's across some of your GNA functions. Yes, I think most, most CEOs believe that it'll have a material impact on productivity. Should they start thinking about, okay, productivity as long as we don't have fake news or fake algorithms or actually all, all the bad stuff, uh, you know, including inequality that could come with AI? Look, I, I think there are risks and threat around AI. Um, right now, today, if you look at, we all, we all come across phishing attacks in emails and other conversations, um, but you're going to come across phishing-like attacks and cyber attacks from generative AI that's going to spoof and sound like people you work with. And so I think there is real risk. But if you look across most organizations, yeah. you can tend to deploy AI in relatively conservative ways to increase productivity across your business. And that's where, you, that's where I think you'll see organizations move first. Brian, one of the other things that, you know, we talk a lot about deglobalization or certainly a new form of, of capital. Do we need to start having non-financial metrics to measure companies? Or is that impossible because every company is doing their own thing, so it's, it's difficult to actually evaluate them on par? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Stepping back from AI, I think we're entering into a very interesting um, time in, in corporations' existence where previously the metrics that most companies looked at and focused on were just financial metrics. Yeah. Now you're seeing in Europe and other places outside the US of an increasing number of non-financial metrics, whether it's climate disclosures, whether it's carbon in particular. And I think you're entering a world where companies have made commitments around how they're gonna change the way they operate 
beyond just profitability. And now you're going to see companies have to disclose a set of metrics around that. And then everyone in the press hold those companies accountable. But, but that would be what, for, for better hiring practices? Or because if, if you still get the money right from shareholders, it doesn't have that, that much of an impact on the way a lot of the companies behave going forward. So I think you'll see shareholders who are um, obviously focused on returns, but you'll have other shareholders that are focused on other metrics as well, whether it's talent, diversity, climate, um, the impact that you have on your uh, on the broader set of stakeholders. And I think we're operating an environment as well, and we saw that through the great resignation, where also your employees want to work for organizations that actually hold the same values. And also, come, your customers want to buy from organizations that hold the same values. So how is your organization do you share information about your values and I think that's going to come from an increase in non-financial metrics. I mean I guess values at the moment are ESG it's you know possibly f flexibility of working from home D does AI come into this on how companies use AI and whether this matches my values. I think AI is going to have as we talked about a material impact on productivity and I think how companies use that AI on productivity is going to come right back and impact the values of your employees and how they see you deploying AI. Do you see? Do they see you employing AI in a way that not just drives productivity but also improves the quality of work? Um, but organizations are equally focused on driving productivity from AI. Well, if you look at the, the, the ideal company, how do they think about all of these different subsections? So it could be AI, it could be climate disclosure. And, and some of the, the big things going forward. I don't know whether they need to think about not becoming Kodak, right, not disappearing, or whether you know, they need to think about trying to lead from the front. Yeah, it's a great point. At Diligent, we work with 25,000 organizations and 700,000 board members use our application. Yeah. And I would say across all the board members use our applications and the dialogue they have in boardrooms, it's a right balance of how do we deploy yeah. things to make sure that we move forward and can actually push forward on productivity, on innovation, mm -hmm. um, while still being conservative enough and practical enough where you're not creating more risk to your organization. I mean, talking about timeline, again, there, there's something called the Morrow's Law, which I keep on get reminded quite often, is that we sometimes overestimate the impact that something has in the short term, but underestimating the long term. Or is this the case? I, I think it's exactly right. And you hear this used many times over, whether it was the internet, the shift to mobile. I think people are very, very hyped about the impact of AI today. But I think what you're going to see over the course of long term is real material productivity shift. Uh, and innovation for companies. I, I think the Citadel founder was warning everyone last week not to overhype the, the switch to AI. Could it become like a metaverse moment where everyone was talking about metaverse and then, you know, we quickly go on to the, the, the next thing? Or is this something that's really here to stay and really change our behavior? I think the dynamic or where I separate the two are in two different ways, which is one, from CEOs, you see, there is real opportunity over yeah. the course of the next 12 to 24 months to drive more productivity across yeah. your business. I think that is very real and true. How much new innovation, product, et cetera, I think you'll see more hesitation and, and, uh, and balance as people you know, trade off that metaverse moment. All right, Brian, thank you so much for joining us. Brian Stafford, their Diligent Corporation's Chief Executive Officer. Coming up, Hong Kong-based life insurance broker RE Lee International is looking to expand in the UK, so we'll speak to the Chief Executive Officer, Calvin Lowe. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. and Francine Lacqua here in London. Now we're just getting some breaking news out of Italy. We understand from Il Corriere della Sera, one of the most respected newspapers in Italy, that the former Italian Premier Silvio Berlusconi has died age 86. Now Berlusconi was hospitalized in Milan on Friday, just three weeks after being released from a previous treatment. He has a history of heart ailments, including a malfunctioning valve that surgeons replaced in 2016. He was hospitalized for lung infection in 2020. Um, this was Italy's longest serving post-war prime minister. Of course, he was also plagued by sexual scandals and allegations of corruption. He is also now in a coalition with the current prime minister, Giorgia Meloni, and so that could also have implications for the stability of the government. So he has a good chunk of that coalition government. He doesn't have an heir apparent, so we'll see exactly what happens in the next couple of hours and days. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Sarah Halls. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Francine. 
UBS has reportedly completed the acquisition of Credit Suisse. It's the biggest merger in banking since the 2008 financial crisis. UBS agreed to take over Credit Suisse in March in an emergency sale brokered by the government after a confidence crisis and a flood of client outflows put Credit Suisse on the verge of bankruptcy. U.S. agribusiness Bungie is said to be nearing a deal to acquire Glencore backed Viterra. Sources say the deal may be announced by Monday and that Bungie shareholders will hold a significant majority. The acquisition will create an agricultural giant large enough to take on Cargill and Archer Daniels Midland. Crispin Odie's main hedge fund will be run by his co-manager Freddie Neve following his ouster. The London-based firm decided to remove its founder who's fresh, fresh assault allegations. Crispin Odi has denied the allegations. Meanwhile, the Financial Times says EU funds managed by Odi's firm are discussing restrictions on withdrawals amid fears of high outflows in the coming days. Lumina's board has accepted the resignation of CEO Francis de Souza, handing a victory to Carl Icahn, who had been seeking his removal. De Souza initially survived the activist investor's attack when he was one of eight directors re-elected last month. Charles Dadswell was named interim CEO, while the San Diego-based gene tech company seeks a replacement. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Sarah Halls, and this is Bloomberg. Francine. Sarah, thank you so much. Sarah Halls in Dubai. Now, Hong Kong-based insurance broker RA Lee International is looking to expand here in the UK. Joining us now is RA Lee International's Chief Executive Officer is Calvin Lowe. Calvin, thank you so much for joining us. Now, we talk about the UK every day. Many, many companies actually decide to come away from the UK. Um, you're opening a London office. You cater to high net worth individuals. Where do you see the opportunity? Well, I think the opportunity has always been here. Um, you know, it's, it's a global, globally as a, as, a, as a hub, financial hub, despite what's going on um, the last few years, pandemic, post-pandemic, everyone's rushing back here. Um, business is back on track, yeah. um, at least from my perspective. So it's, it's a good opportunity. And so, Calvin, so who are you trying to cater for here in the UK? Is it foreigners that come and live here? Is it Hong Kongers that maybe have moved uh, to London and elsewhere in the UK? Or is it actually British nationals? Uh, it's a combination of all, actually. Um, basically, we're targeting the, the ultra high network. It's a niche market, but we're providing a niche solution for them. So um, to answer your question, it's, it's all high net worth individuals who have liquidity issues, um, and that's the, the, the market that we're trying to get in. Look, you're a private company, and we understand, though, that it's a very lucrative niche market. How have behaviors of ultra high net worth individuals, and we're talking, I mean, who do you cater for? It's even, you know, smaller than the 1%. And how have their demands changed with the pandemic and beyond? I think demand has changed, um, not in terms of the product or the solutions per se, but I think the age group that um, people are getting these solutions have changed meaning they're more polarized, uh, more elderly and more younger clients. Mm -hmm. So previously, our average client's age would be roughly around 50, 60. Mm -hmm. Now there's a, a clear cut between like 30, 40 and 60, 70. Okay. And why do you think that is? Again, the 30, 40, are they thinking more about life beyond? Or there, is there a, a different actually um, a, a kind of clientele and engagement with their life insurer? I think what happened throughout the pandemic really changed the mindset. Um, the, the transferring of wealth to the next generation or third generation is happening. And the pandemic has definitely created some, yeah. created a pause. Um, and reality is starting to hit this, the younger families where they want to ensure the legacy continues, even at that yeah. age. So, um, you know, buying insurance or setting up some sort of like structure yeah. today is always Okay. more efficient than tomorrow. So, Kevin, how do you market? How do you get the attention of these ultra high net worth individuals? Do you have to have partnerships with some of the, the asset managers or is it word of mouth? Uh, most of our referrals are from okay. private banks, um, law firms, accounting firms. Yeah. But nowadays, a lot of it is actually word of mouth because that, that niche group is very small. Yeah. So, you know, once once they feel comfortable and they, they work with you for quite a few years, they would, you know, refer to clients, their, their family members, their business partners to us. Calvin, Formula One, you're always in the headlines because you want to buy, you know, parts of like, do you love Formula One personally or do you think it, it makes a good business sense? I, I love Formula One personally and uh, I do believe it does make business sense. Um, but it does take time. 
Um, I, I think we have to make sure that we're not going in there rash yeah. without going through the calculations, yeah. um, hit those milestones, hit those yeah. marks, then one should consider. So, so what's your ultimate plan? Like how much you're willing to spend to do what? I'm willing to spend uh, enough money to make sure that there's uh, enough Asian exposure in the F1 world. Um, however that much is, I'm not sure yet. Um, I think that those numbers and a lot of players are still in negotiation stage right now. So, but it, it is a big opportunity um, for the F1 community and for, for, for everyone in Asia. Okay, Calvin, it's a great pleasure to, to have you on air. So we'll get you back on uh, also to talk about Formula One. Calvin sure. Lowe there, Ari Lee International Chief Executive Officer. Now, we just also had news about 10 minutes ago of Silvio Berlusconi, uh, the media mogul in Italy, whose reign as Italy's longest serving post-war prime minister was also plagued by scandals. He has died. This is according to the Italian newspaper Il Corriere della Sera. He was 86 years old. Berlusconi was hospitalized in Milan on Friday, just three weeks after being released from a previous treatment. Now, this has implications for the stability of the Italian government, given he's in coalition with Giorgia Meloni. We'll see who the heir apparent is. For the moment, there's not one uh, name that comes to mind, but we'll see what happens in the next couple of hours and, of course, days. We'll have plenty more on Italian politics. We'll also talk UK politics. Coming up, is Britain adrift? Some of the world's top executives are fearful of Britain's post-Brexit investment climate. We find out why. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Now, complaints from some of the world's biggest companies highlighting the UK's deteriorating investment climate. And some are not convinced that the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's plans will be enough to jumpstart growth. Now, that's the subject of today's Bloomberg's Big Take. Is Britain adrift? Well, Bloomberg's Caroline Hepker has been, uh, of course, digging into some of the findings and joins us now. And this comes actually after a lot of political turmoil, I have to say, in the last 72 hours. So why are some of the executives sounding now the alarm on Britain as an investment destination? So this was a big dive that we've done across the Bloomberg newsroom and on Bloomberg Radio. So we've heard a lot of criticism in the last couple of months. Think about James Dyson or Stellantis, Revolut or Microsoft. They've all had criticisms for the UK government. And yes, now it looks as if after a very difficult weekend, the government is going to be distracted again in terms of the politics rather than the economics. Essentially, business leaders are worried about the future direction of Britain, whether there is really a long-term plan. So we've spoken to a whole number of business leaders, including Archie Norman, who is the chairman of Marks & Spencer. OK, this is perhaps Britain's best-known brand. He is also himself a lifelong conservative, a former MP and a former advisor to government. He is a real heavy hitter in terms of his views. Um, and I asked him outright, does he think that the UK is adrift? I think there's a huge appetite for a new agenda, for a sense of where are we trying to compete in the world? What is our strategy? Post-Brexit, it's no good just saying we left and we're going to have some trade agreements. It's how are we now going to compete in the world? You know, we've created this dislocation. We've created frictionful trade. You know, rightly or wrongly, that's what people voted to do. Now we need a plan for how we compete. And it used to be called industrial strategy. Now, this government, for whatever reason, has an aversion to the expression industrial strategy. It's what everybody else calls it, so they can't bring themselves to say it. But I don't care whether it's a growth strategy or competitiveness. It's got to be a profound point of view as to how Britain's going to compete. So a profound point of view. That was Archie Norman, the chairman of Marks & Spencer, speaking to me. Look, the Prime Minister's five pledges, which, is, which are largely on the economy, haven't done the trick. Neither has the plan from the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, the Edinburgh reforms. They have not convinced business, at least so far. Archie Norman's also got a range of criticism. He talks about skills. The government is agnostic on what it wants people actually to do in terms of building their skills. He says we've lost the plot when it comes to attracting business 
services to headquarter in London as well as to list. He also talks about specific interventions from government uh, which have been, quote, harebrained. He talks about, um, in particular, this idea of a price cap on essential foods being a failed policy of the 70s that have, has been tried before. So really pretty critical of the direction of government and in need of something longer term. And, and Caroline, I guess, you know, the political drama with mm. Boris Johnson and also Nicholas Sturgeon doesn't help things as, as, you know, the government could be distracted once again. Yeah, this is the issue. I mean, Rishi Sunak was speaking at Tech Week this morning uh, in London, yeah. talking about trying to make Britain uh, an AI hub and a regulator here in, in the UK. This comes after 72 hours in which Boris Johnson's resignation means that there will be three by-elections. This is going to put the Conservatives to the test at a really difficult moment. Up in Scotland, the SNP leader, the face of Scottish independence, Nicola Sturgeon, was arrested, not charged, then released on a separate SNP issue around finances. That means Labour could have a chance there. This is looking very precarious politically. But again, it's the pol politics and perhaps the internal machinations of the Conservative Party that dominate rather than the really big post-Brexit economic issues. Caroline, thank you so much. As always, Bloomberg Radio's Caroline Hebker there with that deep dive into the UK. Now more on our breaking news. The former Italian Premier Silvio Berlusconi has died. That's according to Italian media. Let's bring in our Rome Bureau Chief Alessandro Speciale. Alessandro, he does not have a direct role in government, but of course Forza Italia, his party, is a member of the Prime Minister's right-wing coalition. So what does that mean for the stability of Italian politics? Well, it's, an, it's still an open question. I think uh, even if Berlusconi had been healed for weeks and for months, it had been re reported and revealed that he was suffering from leukemia and he was 45 days in hospital only in recent months, uh, the Italian political system is still shell-shocked. Uh, Matteo Salvini, his uh, long ally, was apparently in tears on Italian TV, uh, TV when he got the news. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Forza Italia was 100% dependent on Berlusconi as a person, on his uh, charismatic figure. What will happen to Forza Italia without Berlusconi? It's difficult to imagine that it can go on as it is. And of course, uh, Giorgio Meloni, the Prime Minister, is stronger than ever. Okay, Alessandro, thank you so much. And of course, he has been written off repeatedly by commentators and political rivals following some uh, pretty bad electoral defeats, but he just kept on coming back. So it's a real force of nature uh, that has defined Italian politics for the good or for the worse, depending on where you stand. Now, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour with Kriti Gupta in New York, Anna Edwards here in London, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Kriti Gupta. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Central banks in the U.S., Europe, China and Japan are poised to decide on interest rates this week. The Fed's expected to take its first pause from its rate hike campaign that started 15 months ago. Goldman Sachs raises its year-end target for the S&P 500. Strategists say the rally in U.S. equities will broaden beyond mega-cap tech stocks. And the deal is done in Switzerland. UBS has completed its takeover of Credit Suisse, creating a global wealth management titan. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. And it certainly is a very, very busy week when it comes to the macro picture and central banks to the fore, Kriti. And I wonder what kind of surprises are in store for us this week, Anna. Of course, last week we had the Bank of Canada, uh, the RBA, and very quickly the pricing around a lot of what the Federal Reserve is going to do next week, uh, excuse me, this week, really change uh, very quickly and create a little bit of volatility. What you're seeing right now is perhaps a little bit of optimism in the markets. But remember, you have seen caution come out on Friday. So 
perhaps a little bit more willingness to hop in this market. We're looking at futures higher by about four tenths of one percent, forty three sixty five on that contract for our radio audience here. To me, what's interesting, though, is the two year yield, because as we price in those more hawkish bets from the Federal Reserve and potentially central banks around the world, the Federal Reserve is what I have my eye on. We're looking at a two year yield that's getting closer and closer to five percent. And remember when that call for the terminal rate at five percent was such a scandalous call led by Bloomberg Economics is Anna Wong. Now it kind of feels like a two-year yield is saying, well, maybe we might be able to go a little bit higher, really shown by the fact that it's getting closer and closer to that level. 460 on that uh, contract there, higher by about one basis point early in the session. But we'll really keep an eye on it. Remember, sustainability above that 4.5% level is crucial for the two-year yield from a technical basis. Uh, the dollar is interesting because we are seeing a little bit of weakness broadly across all the currencies. But I have a big eye on China right now, which brings me to the dollar versus the offshore yuan. You are seeing the lowest level for the offshore you want this year. It's an enormous deal as we start to see the PBOC talk about perhaps expecting uh, or excuse me, accepting a little bit of a weaker currency. That's going to be interesting to watch. But on the back of that, you see a massive ripple effect, Anna, in the commodity space, specifically iron ore that overnight was down about 5% in the Asian session, now seeing a little bit of weakness down about five tenths of 1%. Yes, and Chrissy, oil price is also reflecting that weakness when it comes to the China story. Uh, that's weighing on the London market. So we're broadly positive across European stocks today. But energy is one underperforming sector and the UK market is uh, just up by two tenths of one percent. Whereas the Zetradax benefiting from the auto space, which goes higher, up by more than one percent over on the German market. Let's roll on and show you what we've got in terms of that energy story, because it is the worst performing sector for much of this morning here in Europe. And that is all because Brent crude continues to fall down by another 2.3 percent. Concerns once again, then, Chris about China and also people asking questions whether the Saudi Arabian cut to production has really put any kind of floor under the oil price not looking like it so much right now this is Glencore the mining business the uh, commodity trading business as well up by seven cents of one percent but I wanted to flag uh, a continuation of the saga that is their attempt to buy tech tech resources over in Canada. The latest in this saga is that they've now made a specific cash offer for the coal part of the business. They're hoping that might smooth the way. They still want to buy the whole of tech, but for the moment they're approaching on that front. And tech says it is considering that particular approach. So we'll continue to watch that one. Nova Nordisk is up by over 1%. They make treatments around uh, diabetes, of, of course, and, uh, and, and obesity, sorry. And so as a result, we're seeing uh, further investment in this growing part of their, of their business. They're making an investment into to Denmark, into further production facilities in Denmark. Uh, but this isn't about the obesity drug where they've seen some supply chain issues. It's about preventing perhaps supply chain issues in other parts of the company. And I just want to put in the UK yield story here because we've got yields going higher a little bit more in Europe than we're in, sorry, in the UK than we have elsewhere in Europe. And we heard from Jonathan Haskell who was talking about it, the importance of leaning into the inflation fight. So perhaps that uh, cements expectations around more hikes from the BOE, Chrissy. And certainly an interesting dynamic for this week for the Federal Reserve as well. Really, central banks this week are going to be uh, seeing some big market moves. In the U.S., though, investors loading up on call options before that rate decision. At one point, showing the biggest bias towards calls. And get this. 14 months. One big call the Goldman strategists have made is that the rally in U.S. equities is going to go broadly, broadly beyond tech. Joining us now, Bloomberg Markets reporter Valerie Titel joins us to walk us through the call. A little bit of optimism baked in these markets, which is interesting, Valerie, because we're talking about potentially a more hawkish stance. How do you square the two? Look, Critty, I think people found themselves behind on this equity rally and are now looking for reasons to chase it. As you mentioned, that, that call ratio on the U.S. exchange has gradually been increasing uh, over the, the month of May uh, and June. And then retail investors have also turned very bullish. Uh, and then we heard from Goldman over the weekend. They've raised their year-end target to 4,500, implying a 5% rally from here to year-end, saying that, as you mentioned, the the, the rally should broaden beyond tech, and they argue that prior narrow rallies have always been followed by a general valuation catch-up, noting that in the nine past episodes of narrow rallies since the 1980s, all have been followed by a catch-up in valuations from broader uh, equity sectors that ultimately extended the rally in the S&P. So Goldman is flipping bullish from there. Okay, so Goldman turning more bullish on the S&P, a little bit less bullish on oil, I saw, and also interesting what they say on China. Goldman expecting an L-shaped recovery in the Chinese property market. Is L a recovery shape? That was my same question when I read that headline this morning. Doesn't imply very much of a recovery with an L, uh, but they are uh, expecting a more 
multi-year long drag of the housing sector on Chinese growth. And the big view here is that policymakers are not going to use the, the, the property sector like they have in the past as a stimulus tool. Remember back in 2015, 2018, they really engineered an upcycle in the property market. But the, Goldman is saying they don't expect that very specific uh, stimulus to, be ha to, to come again. And instead, China is going to focus more on strategically important sectors if they do any easing in the next few months. Uh, and of course, the interesting part is the fallout you're going to see in the metal space as a result. Bloomer's Valerie Titel walking us through that story. Uh, thank you, as always, this morning. Speaking with the metal story, blank check firm of a Russian metal industry veteran has agreed to acquire two Brazilian mines for $1 billion, including debt, and a bid to tap demand from EV makers. Joining us now is Ben Sent, Bloomberg's managing editor covering deals. Ben, walk us through this deal, walk us through this transaction. How is it different from what we're seeing in the SPAC space broadly? Well, one thing that's really interesting is just that it's targeting a really hot space. They've got these producing mines in Brazil. They're targeting nickel, copper. These are metals that go into electric vehicles, and the automotive industry is desperate to secure supply. Battery makers are scrounging around the world to see if they can get, um, find ways to get the metals that they desperately need to ramp up production. The really interesting thing is that they've got a ton of money lined up for this deal, unlike some other SPAC deals where they really struggled to secure the financing. So you've got people like Volkswagen, you've got uh, the Chrysler owners, Stellantis, putting in money. Glencore is getting an offtake agreement. They've got bank financing, they've got royalty financing lined up. So it looks like a deal where they've really got the money and found some good assets. Okay, so we see manufacturers going up the supply chain, so trying to secure those supplies. Glencore also in the news over a different deal. I mentioned it a little bit earlier. Uh, they're trying, once again, they keep trying to buy the tech business, the tech uh, resources business in Canada. This time specifically targeting the coal side. How does this change the game in terms of Glencore's pursuit of tech? This basically opens the door for them to talk. Tech has made it really clear that they do not want to talk about a deal for the entire business. They're really keen on the split because their investors want to exit coal. So Glencore, by coming in for the coal business, this gives them an opportunity to speak to tech, which has been ignoring them so far. Now they're willing to engage, and they can also try to discuss the merits of their deal for the whole company. It kind of gets them to the table. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Ben. Bloomberg's Ben Sent joining us with the latest on those M&A themes surrounding the resources space. Now, UBS has completed its takeover of Credit Suisse, sealing the biggest merger in banking since the 2008 financial crisis. Let's get more now with Bloomberg's Leo uh, Ken Sherpa, who has details for us. Uh, good morning to you, Leo. So what does the completion mean then more practically for UBS and the Credit Suisse business that they've just acquired? Yes, so UBS has now full access to Credit Suisse's business and it can see the clients, the deals and also the loan exposures and it can now properly decide which parts of the business it wants to keep and which parts it wants to wind down. And that review is likely uh, to lead to thousands of job cuts. Talk to us a little bit about kind of more of the details around this particular merger. It's the biggest banking merger since 2008. What does it mean more broadly when we talk about the banking sector, arguably on both sides of the Atlantic? Yes, so I think two implications really. One for the broader wealth management market. Um, you know, UBS has been a giant uh, player uh, already before the deal. And now uh, I think competitors will watch this even bigger player very closely. And it also has implications for the Swiss economy because Swiss companies now have fewer options when it comes to financing. And it will be interesting to see the fallout from that. Leo, thanks very much. Bloomberg's finance reporter Leo Ken Sherpa with the latest on that uh, M&A uh, deal uh, coming at, uh, as it did a few, uh, a few months ago, finalised today in Swiss banking. Coming up, investors bracing for a marathon of central bank decisions. More on that with Janet Mui, RBC Bruin Dolphin, head of market analysis. We'll get an update on their equities call. A lot to price in right now. Plus, we will bring you our exclusive interview with the DeepMind CEO, Demis Hassabis, on the innovation and regulation of AI. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Look, this week is all about central banking. You've got the Federal Reserve, the BOE, the ECB. You've got plenty of talk about potentially needing to stay even more hawkish as we talk about inflation in some parts of the world hitting a double peak and other parts of the world just not coming down uh, fast enough. A conversation on this side of the Atlantic and a Federal Reserve specifically not able to really dent the labor market in a meaningful way and the other parts of the world perhaps seeing some sort of a revival of commodity prices feeding into the inflation picture. For our radio audience, I want to bring you a chart for our TV audience. Uh, stick with me here. We are looking at the average G10 policy rate. Essentially, out of the 10 largest economies in the world, you are seeing essentially every single central bank has hiked except for the Bank of Japan. And what you are looking at with that average G10 policy rate is that it's kind of really shot up higher, but is starting to curve just a little bit. That convexity is crucial, Anna, as we simply talk about whether or not this is going to sustain and how quickly those odds of a recession get in there. That's something we're going to be discussing with our next guest here. Bloomberg's Lynn Thomason joins us now. Lynn, walk us through this week and what the biggest surprise could be around the world. Oh, interesting. Uh, so, I mean, I think the theme for this week is obviously going to be central bank decisions and U.S. CPI data. I mean, there's just a lot of central banks coming out with the Fed, the ECB, um, China's coming out with a decision later in the week. So I think all eyes are going to be on what central bankers say and what are some of the discussions around what, what where they could take interest mm. rates next. Uh, Lynn, uh, good morning to you. I mean, where do you think the biggest uh, discussion will be or the, the biggest uncertainty? Because, yeah, sure, the Fed could surprise, but the expectation is this kind of hawkish uh, hawkish skip, if you like. The ECB, the expectation is a hike. Um, the PBOC, though, a lot of different opinions yeah. there about whether we get some kind of movement from the Chinese. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the interesting thing with China is that everyone has been so bearish that there's been this expectation of policy support and it really hasn't come. So it seems like, you know, the expectation is they're going to hold. And, um, you know, you know, you talk to a lot of investors and they say now is not the time to, to get into China. Well, speaking of that China story, the diversion between the PBOC and the Federal Reserve and the other banks, I want to say in the West as well, how much of a concern is that? And it seemed to be in 2020, 2021, but is that still something we should be watching for, that the PBOC may not be on the same page? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, looking at the, t the inflation chart of those two countries, you know, the interesting thing is that, um, you know, in U.S. inflation has continued to go higher and China has continued to be quite subdued. I mean, that in some ways speaks to the strength of the economies that we're a lot seeing a lot of concern about the Chinese um, you know, health of the economy. And, you know, in the U.S., things have continued to be very strong. Yeah, and the Chinese defla defla uh, inflation, sorry, almost in deflation, as we covered, covered last week. Yeah. So we'll get plenty of data out, as well as these ECB, uh, sorry, these uh, policy meetings. But sticking with the policy meetings, the ECB is one of those. Uh, is there a sort of difficulty with the concept of the ECB continuing to hike, even if we see the Fed on pause? Or is that something the ECB is just strong enough to get on, get away with? Yeah, I mean, I think definitely the consensus is going to, ECB is going to continue hiking um, and the Fed is, is going to be on this pause and you're sort of seeing this divergence. And if you take a step back, I mean, I think what we're really seeing is this kind of muddying or this difficulty of really what happens next that so we're transitioning from a time when everyone was hiking and it was very clear what was going to happen to mm. now there's a lot of discussion you're seeing like we saw with um, Australia and Canada last week, you know, they think they're on pause, but then they come out and actually hike. All right, Lynn, a final question on this. When you talk about the hiking story here, let's translate that to the markets. How much of that is actually priced in? How much of that could, could rattle the potential optimism we're seeing it this morning? Uh, the million dollar question. Uh, how much of it is priced in? I think, you know, these days it feels like the market is really interested in what's going on with AI and tech, and it's really the big tech rally. So in some ways that is a read off of the fact that the, the Fed is, you know, going softer and, you know, this is ongoing discussion of are we going to see a pivot late in the year when will they start to cut um, so I think you know if if the Fed sticks to consensus it's going to be um, very subdued like we've con we've seen in the past few weeks but you know if there's a surprise then then you can expect markets are going to move on that okay Lynn thanks very much Lynn Thomason joining us there with the latest on markets and a look ahead to a very busy week on the central banking front for more market analysis check out MLIV go that's the function to use to find the markets live blog this is Big Mac.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Now keeping up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. In Hong Kong, there's growing concern over the government's intent to ban internet platforms from hosting a protest song. The high court is examining an injunction that would make it illegal for anyone with criminal intent to perform or broadcast a song entitled Glory to Hong Kong. There are fears that the move could prompt Western tech firms such as Google to pull out of the city. Former President Trump is holding on to his Republican base as he heads to court to face federal charges regarding classified documents. About three quarters of likely Republican primary voters in the CBS News YouGov poll said they view the accusations as politically motivated. The former president is due in court in Miami on Tuesday. In the UK, Boris Johnson's surprise resignation from Parliament means a new electoral challenge for Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. Johnson quit Friday after receiving the funding of the investigation into whether he misled lawmakers over his knowledge of COVID rule breaches by officials. The resignation triggered at least three by-elections that could highlight softening support for Sunak's Conservative Party. Former Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi has died. Berlusconi was a billionaire media mogul before becoming Italy's longest-serving post-war prime minister. His more than nine years in office were marked by sex scandals and allegations of corruption. Bloomberg's Stephen Carroll takes a look at his life. Silvio Berlusconi, the flamboyant media mogul and Italy's longest serving post-war prime minister, who was plagued by sex scandals and allegations of corruption, has died. Berlusconi built a television empire in the 1980s before deploying his showmanship and talent for catchy sound bites to win three national elections. He served nine years as prime minister, an unprecedented tenure in a country plagued by revolving door governments. Despite his wealth, his fortune was estimated at $7.5 billion as of April of 2023, according to the Bloomberg Billionaires Index. Berlusconi cast himself as a man of the people, an outsider challenging a discredited ruling class with the promise of national renewal. His style and rhetoric were similar to the rallies of a military leader, a politician, an athletic coach, but most of all they resembled talks of an American self-help guru, wrote biographer Alexander Still. Written off repeatedly by commentators and political rivals following bruising electoral defeats and scandals in his business and private life, Berlusconi found ways to bounce back again and again. But in his last years in power, he struggled to overcome a sex scandal over alleged bunga bunga sex parties that he described as elegant dinners. In recent years, Berlusconi was able to maintain public interest. His Forza political party is a junior member in Giorgia Maloney's current government. He was 86. A truly crucial part of the electoral history in Italy, as well as, of course, the media landscape. And I think what's so interesting is that even after his party lost the kind of dominant power, he still kind of functioned a little bit as a kingmaker in some respects with kind of who he throws his weight behind. Yeah, helping to put together those uh, uh, right side coalitions. And that's got to be the, the, the biggest question now in terms of the political picture that he leaves behind and his lasting impact or, or the impact he still has he, he, even now after his death. The fate of his own party, Forza Italia, which is, as we were just hearing there from Stephen Carroll, part of the uh, coalition that Giorgio Maloney runs. His party is, is part of that. And I know that one of the key questions hanging over this then is what is the future of that party that was so driven by him and his personality and, and his vision? What is the role of that party? Who can take it on? So that'll be certainly something uh, to watch. But certainly a, a character that really divided opinion as well. As we heard there from Stephen, many will know him, of course, as this big electoral success in Italy, but others uh, as somebody who brought allegations of corruption and sex scandals. And, of course, the, the media aspect as well. Look, he still owned uh, quite a bit uh, stake in a mid-sized Italian bank, Banca Mediolanum. Uh, he had controls in a lot of the publishing groups. And, of course, in addition to the massive media landscape he, he really began with, in addition, by the way, uh, to the soccer team, AC Monza, as well. So it really has hands in, in a million and one things. And interesting to see, then, to your point, how Italy progresses from here and what kind of legacy he's left behind in terms of the overlap of those two arenas, Anna. OK, we'll get back to the markets shortly. We'll be talking to uh, Janet Mui from Bruin Dolphin. We'll get her thoughts on where the markets head. Uh, we have a big debate, she says, going on uh, over at Bruin Dolphin about whether to raise their global equity weighting. So we'll certainly talk about that. Given what we've seen that retail investors are doing, wanting to catch up perhaps with some of the rally that maybe they've missed out on uh, in recent months. So we'll watch uh, that conversation closely. Uh, how much does the equity rally still have to give? We'll talk about that with Janet Mui shortly. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Central banks in the U.S., Europe, China, and Japan are poised to decide in interest rates this week. The Fed's expected to take its first pause from its rate hike campaign that started 15 months ago. Goldman Sachs raised its year-end target for the S&P 500. Strategists say the rally in U.S. equities will broaden beyond mega-cap tech stocks. And the deal is done in Switzerland. UBS has completed its takeover of Credit Suisse, creating a global wealth management titan. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Anna, look, it is all about central bank policy, but I think what's crucial here is, is every major central bank around the world really on the same page? And I feel like that's what's going to dictate the market action. Yeah, and, and right in the moment, we don't seem to be on the same page. I mean, the Fed pauses maybe, the ECB hikes perhaps, and opinion divided on what the PBOC does. The BOJ expected to hold Pat, but we'll see if that actually comes to pass. Given all of the central banks we're going to hear from, Critty, perhaps it is surprising we're making such strong gains this uh, this morning here in Europe. The stock 600 up by half a percent uh, this morning. The energy stocks, though, are not doing well, and energy under pressure as a result of a falling oil price down by 2.3% on Brent crude. Glencore is interesting. The stock not moving much, but they're still trying to get hold of tech resources over in Canada and as a result of that the latest part of their approach is to make a cash offer for the uh, coal business and then to try and spin off that coal business they still want the whole of tech but this is the current approach and here we've got the Italian German spread and we're seeing a reduction in that spread um, as we speak down to multi-month lows uh, all of this because uh, investors are being drawn into the Italian BTP market because of uh, the yields relative to the rest of Europe being pretty healthy pretty what do you see in uh, US markets yeah similar sentiment Anna the idea here that you're seeing a little bit of green on the screen, perhaps a little bit of optimism in what could be a very volatile week. What's important to keep in mind is when you look at positioning for the S&P 500, you've actually seen a lot of call options being bought, which tells you that perhaps there is some thought of maybe this could be a sustainable rally, even though mostly so far it's been quite tech heavy. S&P futures higher by about four tenths of one percent on that thought process. 43.64 on those contracts. A two-year yield inching higher just by two basis points, but inching higher nonetheless. We're looking at 462 on the front end of the curve. Again, if you are betting that the Federal Reserve may actually be a little bit more hawkish. That is the yield you want to watch just to see what the bond market is pricing in. To me, though, the currency story is interesting because as we see some weakness in the dollar broadly, by the way, against all the major currencies, the strength is coming a little bit from, or the weakness, I should say, is coming a little bit from the offshore yuan. You are now seeing the offshore yuan trade at the lowest level against the dollar in an entire year. It really speaks to the idea that the Chinese growth story is perhaps allowing the PBOC to accept a slightly weaker uh, currency. And that's going to be an interesting story in terms of the ripple effects for the commodity space, commodities like gold, uh, copper, oil, and of course, iron ore. Okay, Chrissy, let's uh, have a markets conversation now with Janet Mui, RBC Bruins Olfin, head of market analysis, who joins us this morning. Very good uh, to have you with us, Janet. Really interesting to think about where retail investors are putting their money and what that tells us at this point, because I know over at Bruins Olfin, you're thinking about whether you should raise your global equity weighting. Interesting to see this uh, U.S. retail investor measure shows that suddenly we've seen an abrupt bullish flip from uh, retail investors, suddenly turning bullish on this sort of bull bear spread. Uh, does that tell us anything? anything interesting either as a lagging or a forward-looking indicator what US retail investors are up to? Hi, good morning, Anna. Thanks for having me. Uh, I think this data adds to further evidence that the market is probably a bit overbought, so sentiment turning a little bit more bullish. Uh, we also have our own technical uh, sentiment indicators, which is uh, about neutral, but is uh, also getting a little bit bullish, uh, the momentum. So that's why we are cautious, because we think the year-to-date market rally has been very strong, despite the monetary policy being very tight, despite inflation is still pretty much a concern and you know, the, the stress in the regional banking sector, et cetera, et cetera. So we do think there's a bit of froth in the market. So we are, we are a bit cautious, um, and we don't think it is right now the, the time to buy equities. Mm. But you do see an improving backdrop in terms of corporate profits. I wonder what gives you that confidence, Janet. We just did a survey, the Markets Live team doing a survey of, uh, of readers, uh, which showed that there's a belief that greedflation is real, does exist, but that those outsized, non-usual profits will, will come down and will sort of mean revert. Do you not expect to see that, Janet? Yeah, so basically, uh, the past few earnings season, it, it turned out to be better than people anticipated, uh, especially for some of the large tech, big tech companies. So our, our expectation is that we do expect earnings growth to slow down. So that's why we are cautious. We do think that uh, 
the the profit margins is going to come down because consumers are going to be more uh, stressed and squeezed in the future. We, we think that tightening monetary policy, the conditions, is the key why the economy will slow down. And we we think you know while the Fed may keep uh, interest rate at about five percent. I think uh, you will see that lagged impact on the economy going forward, and particularly more more visible in uh, early 2024. So, Janet, what is it going to take then to perhaps see a bigger drawdown? And should we be worried really about a bigger drawdown? Is this an environment where we kind of need to have the economy uh, kind of flush things out, restart to some extent, or perhaps be rescued by something like Fed cuts? Yeah, I think um, the rally year to date we've seen, I think, partially is driven by the expectation of a Fed pivot uh, to the extent that Fed may potentially cut interest rates, which we didn't agree with. So we do think that inflation is going to be a problem. Uh, it is going to be lingering in the background. So unless we address the inflation problem, we, we see inflation back moving towards more than 2% target. I think market will continue to be cautious. And of course, the Fed won't be comfortable with that. And without um, recession, I think it will be very hard to get inflation down to that because, well, what we see in the market is that year to date we've got the rally. Um, it, it actually eases financial conditions. And if there is a broader rally in the equity market, not just the, the several tech names, I think it will further in, improve the financial condition, conditions, which is actually not, not great to fight inflation. So I think ultimately you need some kind of a pullback in market and also a slowdown in the economy, a higher unemployment rate for inflation to come down sustainably. But Janet, if we're talking about keeping interest rates higher for longer, wouldn't it make more sense to kind of use equities as an entry point right now, given that the pain may come later in the economy, and then perhaps see a defensive bid into the U.S. stock market kind of return uh, the bid that you are seeing right now? How do you think about the dynamic between interest rates in the long term, I'm thinking, say, a five-year time horizon, for example, and equities on a five-year time horizon? Yes. Um, so for the longer term, we, I mean, we like U.S. equities. We ha have a preference structurally for U.S. equities, uh, driven by the fact that it is very high in the tech sector, which is very innovative. You have uh, the AI theme going on. The the problem we have right now is is valuation, right? The, the U.S. is trading at a premium, and I mean, in the short term, maybe it doesn't matter too much, but in the longer term, valuation does matter. So. We, as we mentioned at the very beginning of this interview, we think there's a bit of froth in some of these tech names. So we would hope to uh, perhaps get a better entry point sometime later in the year. Uh, but overall, we are uh, favoring U.S. equities and generally global equities in the longer term. So because that's the area where you tend to get the, the best uh, relative returns. Where do you see China heading, Janet? We might get further stimulus from the government or from the PBOC this week. Is that going to change your view on China at all? Um, probably not. I think um, first is the China reopening story is fizzling out. And we don't think that the Chinese authorities are going to embark on a bold easing measure and bold stimulus anyway. So they, they will get very targeted easing measures, which I don't think it will please the market enough. And after all, we are still concerned about the geopolitics and the politics. So um, as as we have actually mentioned many times in the Bloomberg interviews before, we prefer to access our China um, exposure via Western European blue chip companies or Japanese companies that are exposed to Chinese consumers. Janet, thanks very much. Janet Mui of RBC Bruins Dolphin, thanks for joining us with your views on the market. Coming up, Janet was talking about the excitement we've seen around some of those AI themes. We'll certainly dive into that. Our exclusive interview with DeepMind CEO Demis Hassab is coming up next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. AI is dominating the conversation at London Tech Week this week as the UK's top business leaders, policymakers and investors meet. Tom McKenzie is on the ground for us and has been speaking exclusively with the DeepMind CEO, Demis Hassabis, on the AI revolution in scientific research. I think there are three different types of, uh, uh, broadly speaking, buckets of risk. Uh, I think number one is 
uh, bad actors using these dual-purpose technologies in ways that are bad for society. I think that's true of any new transformative technology down the years, so I think AI is no different other than the fact that it's maybe the most general type of technology. So, um, so that becomes a question of access to these technologies, and that's what needs to be thought about there. I think the second one is near-term use cases where uh, things like deep fakes or disinformation or uh, uh, bias in our systems uh, that can affect near-term products and applications that we see today. Uh, and I think that has to be mitigated by uh, some new technologies, things like watermarking, and, and so you can detect deep fakes, but also uh, existing regulation being beefed up uh, in areas like health or transport to deal with the coming new wave of AI, just like we did with the internet and mobile. And then finally, there are these longer-term technical uh, AI risks uh, that I think more research is required to understand them better, understand these systems, where they're going, to, uh, f to allow us to sort of figure out what the bounds are of what these systems can do, how mm. we can control them, what, how do we align them to human preferences. Uh, and then once we understand those better, uh, uh, we can sort of, government and others, uh, international society can um, uh, sort of put the guardrails around it. Um, so I think uh, it's important when you're in very at regions of, you know, accelerating technology, high uncertainty, uh, doesn't mean things are going to go wrong, but it means that we're, it's uncertain about what the underlying technology is going to look like in five, ten years, then I think we should proceed um, with what's called the precautionary principle. So proceed with exceptional care and thought and use things like the scientific method. You're, you're very used to putting probabilities on things. I just want to push you on the most extreme area and the most yeah. extreme risk. And it, I feel almost, hi it feels hyperbolic to yes. talk about hyperbole, to talk about, to talk about potential extinction as a result right. of AI. But in your time, whether it's developing games or as a chess grandmaster, mm -hmm. you know about how to put probabilities sure. on things. What would you put the probability at of AI-linked yep. Extinction. Well, look, I think it's, 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 um, I don't think you can, no one can put a probability on these things. Mm. I think there's a huge amount of uncertainty. Uh, you know, the probability many of my colleagues think is very small. Um, but even if it's very small, uh, uh, one should pay attention to those things and ahead of time, not wait for those things to happen. And if you look at things even like, you know, much less powerful things like social media uh, of the last decade, fantastic benefits to society, many things in individuals in our, in our social lives and so on, but also it has unintended consequences as we're now seeing. Uh, and so uh, I would like us with AI to get ahead of those things and to be pre-prepared and to put down the guard rails, uh, society put down the guardrails ahead of time, not after the fact. Uh, and I think it's too important the technology not to get that right. So I think all that letter was saying is we should pay attention. And, uh, I, you know, I think the prime minister and other governments are. And uh, I think things like the global summit that the prime minister announced in, in the UK, bringing together experts from around the world, uh, from academia, from civil society, from government and from industry uh, to come and talk about these, uh, uh, these risks and these opportunities and then what can be done to mitigate them. Mm. Uh, uh, for example, come up with the right evaluation tests and benchmarks to value what these systems can do and the capabilities they have, um, uh, I think is the, the right next step. And so, for, for those who would say, look, even if there's just a 1% or 2% chance of a catastrophe, then, you know, just stop. Just stop where you're at. What would you say to, to those people? Well, as I said, we, we have no, you know, at the moment, the, there's a huge amount of uncertainty over uh, these future technologies. Mm. It's very hard to predict what's going to happen in 10, 15, 20 years' time. If you think back to 10 years ago or 15 years ago when we started DeepMind, no one thought AI was possible. Uh, no one was working on AI. In, in, when I remember when I was doing my postdoc in academia, the professors would eye roll at you, your, even the mention of AI as being something that's science fiction and not a serious subject. And look how far we've come in the last. 10, 15 years. So I think it's hard to predict uh, 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 things going forward. But the reason to work on AI is what we discussed at the beginning, which is the potential it has to help society with all of these challenges that we have, from disease to climate to energy. Uh, all of these things, I think, can be impacted and helped by a technology, uh, an incredible tool like AI helping the world's experts solve these problems. And what would you advise governments not just the UK government, governments around the world, to focus on, to prioritise now in terms of policies they can enact now to put some guardrails in place around this technology? I think the number one thing that needs to be done right now is to put more investment into uh, uh, AI safety research and understanding uh, uh, what these systems can do, analysing them, interpreting them, and then coming up with things like evaluation benchmarks so that we can uh, understand what capabilities we want uh, and, and what guardrails that we therefore should have to make sure um, society gets, reaps all the benefits of these 
uh, systems and the incredible potential they have, and we mitigate the risks. Last question on jobs. You have children. Are they, would you advise, what jobs would you advise your children to steer away from because you think that in 10, 15, 20 years, they're just not going to exist? Again, I think the whole jobs question is, uh, is a very complicated one to predict. As with, uh, There's no doubt that AI is going to bring uh, changes and disruption. But I actually think if you look at the history of uh, these things like Internet and mobile over the last 10, 20 years, um, they also cause huge, cha huge mm. changes. But actually, um, whole new categories of jobs were invented, actually better quality jobs, higher paid jobs. Uh, and I think that's what's going to happen again with AI. I think it's going to change the job market. But I think uh, in, in, in the, in, uh, in the fruition, you know, fullness of time, I think it's going to create many more uh, higher quality and better paid uh, opportunities than we've had in the past. That was the Deep Mind CEO, Demis Hassabis, with Tom McKenzie at London Tech Week. And Tom McKenzie joins us now. Really fascinating uh, deep dive with the Deep Mind CEO there, Tom, into, well, the possibility of human extinction mm. as a result of AI. What was he saying about AI in scientific discovery? Yeah. Yeah, and this is it. They're weighing up, basically, the risks and the opportunities around this technology and confining, at least defining the risks is proving very challenging. When it comes to the opportunities, Demis Hasebis, of course, a leader when it comes to the build-out of AI large language models and, of course, generative AI. He's much more focused and clearer in terms of where the upside comes through. So I asked him, is it likely that in our lifetime it's possible that as a result of artificial intelligence we could see the eradication of things like dementia and cancer? Take a listen. I think in the next decade, if you, uh, I think it could be very possible that it, we could build these kinds of AI tools to help the world's experts and, and medical researchers make some fast breakthroughs in all of these types of areas, as we've seen with AlphaFold, where we've now used it to fold all 200 million proteins uh, known to science. And uh, we did that in just over a year on, 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 on our computational system. So that kind of acceleration, and we like to call it science at digital speed, uh, I think is going to come to a lot more fields, including medicine. So it's the allure of some of those breakthroughs, some of the upside coming through from technology, from AI, that is keeping these executives focused and in the game, despite those risks, which, again, Demis Hassabis was said, were, were very difficult to categorise. And it's something the Prime Minister, sitting on stage earlier with the founder of DeepMind, also talked about drug discovery, more accurate surgery. And the Prime Minister also said he wants to see AI deployed in schools for tailored learning. Those are the upsides as, again, they weigh up these potential risks. Tom, thanks very much. Bring back Tom McKenzie with us there at Tech Week. And we'll be continuing our coverage of London Tech Week. Uh, tomorrow, Francine Lacroix will be speaking to the UK opposition leader, Keir Starmer, about his vision for tech. Uh, the man who polls, who polls point to as the country's next prime minister, we will have a conversation with him for you tomorrow. That's at 9.30 uh, UK time, 4.30 a.m. Eastern time, if you want to get up early for that stateside. Coming up, a big week for markets with major rate decisions and data on deck. We will take you through it all. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomer Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. We are getting some breaking news, Anna. The Nasdaq is looking to buy Adenza for about $10.5 billion in a cash and stock deal. That, according to the Wall Street Journal, this is enormous. This would be the largest acquisition in the Nasdaq's history. It would also essentially mean that uh, Tama Bravo, which is the owner of Adenza, the, the financial software firm, would get a major stake in the Nasdaq as well. Really interesting crossover between the PE world, uh, where you do, of course, have Tama Bravo as a giant into uh, the idea of public markets. So something to keep an eye on, $10.5 billion, Anna, the largest acquisition in the Nasdaq's history. Yeah, e uh, private markets, interest in public markets, really fascinating one. Uh, let's get a look, Kriti, at the week ahead, and it's going to be a busy week, of course. The latest inflation prints out of Germany, Spain and the US. All of those break on Tuesday. US PPI data will be uh, broken down on Wednesday, followed by the main event, the Fed's rate decision, of course. Then it's the ECB's turn with its decision on Thursday. And finally, the BOJ's rounding out the big week of central bank decisions, followed by Eurozone CPI on Friday. Certainly something to keep an eye on. But look, just hitting our inboxes right now, Kit Jukes over at Sockgen saying, well, it might just be the economic data that matters potentially more than the central bank story. We're joined now by Bloomberg's Simone Foxman, who's covering 
all of the stuff that we haven't talked about yet, which is the massive week for data. Walk us through what is ahead. What should we be paying attention to? Well, we go from this sort of high level perspective on the consumer and the economy to sort of this more nitty gritty with rounding out the week with retail sales uh, and with UMish consumer confidence. First off, that all important CPI number for May expected to show that consumer prices are slowing in their growth. The headline number expected to come down to 4.1% and the core number uh, stripping out some of those more uh, gas those sorts of things coming down to 5.2 percent that would be the slowest since November uh, 2021 we're also looking at producer prices where the headline is supposed to come down to 1.5 percent so look we have those consumer prices well above the Fed's target but the producer prices a little bit different and that's something we're following here particularly you look at this chart uh, where PPI is in blue CPI is in orange producer price growth growth clearly slowing mm. at a much faster pace than, than consumer prices. We'll see how the Fed comes out on that little tidbit as well. Okay, and looking to the end of the week then, Simone, what is the data expected to tell us about the U.S. consumer? Well, we are expected to see U.S. retail sales slow. In fact, the headline number going to negative 0.1%, so a little bit negative there. But this is one we've seen jump around quite a lot, and I think it reflects this overall challenge to understand exactly what the consumer is doing. And one more complication here is that we got well, out from Wayfair a little bit of an update on what's happening this quarter. This is that online discount furniture retailer and they said that year on year sales growth is actually slowing a little bit slower than they were seeing in the first quarter or return to order growth again this mm. just a challenge uh, to understand exactly what the consumer is doing even though we do expect expect to see retail sales uh, slow a little bit Simone, thanks very much. Bring back Simone Foxman with the latest on the outlook for U.S. data. Lots more of the, uh, of the pieces of that particular jigsaw to be assembled as we go through this week. That puzzle coming together. That is it for Early Edition. Surveillance is ahead. This is Bloomberg.